Thanks so much for joining me today. Oh yeah, you betcha. How are things going up there? They're good. We're uh, just finishing up some final blends for the last of the uh, um, uh, bottling run. We we did uh, the majority of our. Can you shut the door, please? Thank you. Um, we finished up uh, the main run of bottling uh, in June. So right now we're just getting things ready. We're um, and then we'll wrap up the bottling season with our sparkling production. Excellent. Productive summer, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Great. Well, as you know, um, we're doing virtual visits for Slow Wine Guide this year instead of doing in-person ones because of changing regulations and conditions around travel right now. Um, I've visited Lamar Landing in the past, but not for a while now. Um, so I would love to start from the beginning and have you tell us a little bit of the story of the winery and the roles of some of the key people who work there. Right, so uh, Lamar Landing was founded in 1990. Uh, and they opened the doors in 1992, um, with 1990 being their first vintage. Uh, currently, our case production is around 12,000 cases, and that's vintage dependent on the season. Um, we have uh, 112 acres uh, under vine right now. Uh, and we practice uh, all sustainable grape growing techniques. Uh, we've been uh, certified with the uh, Cornell Vine Balance Program since 2009. So always been industry leaders being ahead of the curve with sustainability and being aware of uh, premium quality. And we know that it begins in the vineyard and we try to translate that into the cellar as well. And um, we're very, very mindful of everything that we put into the wine. Uh, we're low impact. We really want it to be just expressive of each site and you know of those 112 acres it's it's a very very unique different site so a lot of uh, variability to the terrain uh, with the soil structures uh, you know the predominant soil substrate is a limestone dolomitic limestone so you get this incredible character and texture from the wine and we have this ability to retain the acidity as well so there's a lot of vibrancy to the wines along with the delicate uh, uh, makeups that they have. Um, yeah, we don't use any herbicides for weed control. It's completely mechanized, so we do undervine cultivation, so that helps build the soil profile as well and encourages uh, beneficial bacterial growth in the soil. You know, it just speaks, you know, another layer to our awareness of the, you know, this incredibly unique uh, site and the region that we grow grapes in it's you know it really is is unlike any region in the world um i think that's often why the world has a tough time understanding these wines because they're completely unique um once people get in their head how these wines uh have been built and grown uh they're yeah completely distinctive and unique so that's you know and lamb has been doing as one of the originals is as and only vinifera uh you know really holding uh a strong edge to that that mindset um which is you know what makes lamoral the you know probably the most unique winery in the finger lakes is its intent originally and never you know never bending fantastic um, will you tell me a little bit more about your specific location and your vineyards and how that informs the grape varieties that you work with? So we're located on the east side of Seneca Lake uh, in, the, in Lodi, New York. So we sit on this point of ground that overlooks the, uh, the lake and uh, the vineyards are southwest facing slopes. And so because of that, um, we have the ability to get premium ripening, uh, really, really good uh, air drainage, uh, great sun exposure. We sit high up in elevation, so we retain sun throughout most of the day. So, uh, you know, the varieties that we planted, Chardonnay, Riesling, Cab Franc, uh, Merlot, uh, Grunewald, Liener, Muscat, Atenal, uh, Pinot Noir, 
and Gebert Straminer, you know, they're all great, cool climate vinifera. They're, you know, by and large, pretty aromatic in terms of wines, white and red. They really do well on this site. And, um, you know, there was a lot of, a lot of work that went into figuring out how to grow them the right way. And um, right now, everything is trellised to a Scott Henry uh, trellising system. So it's a full canopy. Um, you know, you have, I think it's uh, six feet of uh, green canopy versus the typical three feet when you have with just typical vertical shoot positioning. So this incredible sun exposure, we do leaf plucking. So there's uh, the, the rachis are exposed to sun immediately uh, at bloom. And, you know, these varieties, they grow really well here because it's just such a unique site. Like I was saying before, it has really good drainage, uh, good sun exposure. You know, the soils have really good water holding capacity and combined with the limestone profile and the roots have this ability to tap into a lot of unique uh, soil profiles that generate these different flavor compounds that form in the fruit. So it's, you know, it's through years of understanding how different clones work, um, mm -hmm. what, you know, the forerunners that were doing plantings in the 50s and 60s of vinifera, and then looking at the 80s, how things started to change over from uh, what really started to work. I mean, you know, a lot of varieties have been planted in the Finger Lakes over the years, you know, before my time. I've only been here for 18 years, so I've been lucky to see it, this arc from the changing of the original uh, generation to this, to the new generation of kind of this, kind of came in this really fascinating time in the early 2000s. Because uh, it's just, yeah, it's like you, I don't, if I were to, I don't recognize it from what it was when I first came here, which is an amazing thing because not a lot of wine regions are like that because a lot of wine regions are steeped in tradition. And that's another thing about the Finger Lakes is that it is not afraid to, um, look to the world and then make it make other things its own so. definitely I, uh, I I've even seen a lot change you know in five years right like I first visited in 2014 and I went back last year and so many things had evolved and changed and there was so much more energy and quality and like that's what the you know the dynamic of, of the Finger Lakes is to me yeah yeah, it's, yeah, I mean, and I was just, we were just, I was talking to my wife about this uh, yesterday about the vintages and how different they are. Somebody posted a picture, they had found like a bottle of a 2009 Pinot Noir. And I'm like, oh man, you know, that year, those 2000s, that was kind of like, a, that was a great year for those Burgundians because it was a cooler year later on. But at the beginning of that season in September, or early October, it was really warm. So you had these really great profiles that were, form during the ripening but just to thinking of like into the the teens um of this decade they're just so something happened with the with the whole mindset of the finger lakes and with the, the seasons and how they've changed you know and that's you know another thing the uniqueness of the finger lakes is that it's every year is so different so unique sometimes challenging always rewarding you know that's the great thing about Lamro is that the fruit that's grown here is just impeccable um mm -hmm. i've worked with this fruit um for you know like i said since 2002 and it's always been just this incredible like statement of uh what can be done with the right growing practices with the right technique um but yeah yeah fantastic yeah, you spoke a little bit about some of your vineyard management practices. Have you made any major changes in the last year to how you manage your vineyard or are these practices that you've kind of honed over time? These have been uh, dialed in over the course of the last 30 years. Um, back in the early 2000s, there was a tremendous amount of research that was done through Cornell and the uh, research extension agencies with canopy management. I, like I mentioned before with Scott Henry, but uh, regards to uh, leaf pulling in the fruit zone and understanding that the earlier it's done, the better uh, effect it has on 
reducing certain compounds, specifically Cabernet Franc, uh, the methylpyrazine, which is the bell pepper character, um, pretty much eliminated that uh, through this technique. But you know, other than that, it's just a lot of it is this the onset of uh, new mechanization and being aware of developing new technologies. Um, you know, the leaf plucker that we have actually is um, air jets, so it pierces the, the the it pierces the leaf, so it doesn't disrupt the canes or the canopy in any regard. So it's really really um, low impact on the fruiting zone. Uh, you know, we hedge the vines with a blade with a blade hedger versus a sickle bar so we have really great precision there and that's i think those are the bigger things that we're seeing to come um i mean our mechanical harvester is it's this brand new technology it has an onboard uh destemmer so it removes any uh, material other than grapes the mod okay. and you know so you're getting this these perfectly ripened berries knocked off the canopy that are completely unbroken and de stem so they're in these bins without anything else. So there's no influence other than the fruit that we see. So that's those are the things that we that we see more than anything. The cultural practices and 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 the mindset um, has been pretty good. You know that's that's something that okay. really dialed in. Um, now it's just adding these little little bits and pieces as we go along. Fantastic. Switching over to the winemaking side, how would you define your winemaking style and has that changed over the years? Yeah, I, you know, that was, uh, to speak to myself personally, uh, as a young person coming to the Finger Lakes, uh, you know, the style were reaching towards the West. Um, and I saw quickly on that the Finger Lakes is so unique in that it, um, has this delicate, beautiful personality to the wines. Um, the whites have this acid structure that's totally unique in that the on from the chemistry standpoint, you look at the pH and the, the titratable acidity and the the bricks at harvest, and it seems like this is they're going to be a little little nervy, little jumpy. But as they go through primary fermentation and with tank aging, things kind of come together and sort of fold in to each other really well. So you get these bright, explosive white wines. With the reds, uh, they're really perfumed and buoyant, and the tannins have this fine, sensual, crunchy character more often than not. So with our winemaking style here, it's really representative of how everything can kind of come together and be well-knit. So. With the whites, they're take age usually for, from the rosé, it's about three months to uh, the Chardonnay, about nine months. Uh, with the reds, they're either with our T23 on Oak Cab Franc, which we were one of the first in the Finger Lakes to do that. The first vintage of that was in 2002. Um, so that sees only stainless steel, whereas the um, red, other red barrel program, uh, they see 18 months of oak, but it's six months, six to nine months in newer barrels, which is only a small percentage, more, no more than 20% of the blend, and then another 12 months uh, in neutral barrels, so barrels that are seven to 15 years old. So we really want to encourage those acids to come together, the tannins to come into a place where they're fine-grained and they really soften out. They're not, they don't have that waxy character, they have that really light, uh, flavorful, profile and you know the extraction that we're looking for is there within three to four days of fermentation so we're finding the extraction is up front so anything else that happens after that is more build of the nose um, build of the fruit profile that's in the skins versus trying to create this weight that is isn't there but that's the whole thing about the finger lakes and especially lamero is that it is a it's they're incredibly complex wines and you have to think outside of the box when you're looking at them uh i think that's sometimes is a challenge for people but as they come here they do tastings with us and like i said since i was here 18 years ago to now the people that come here understand that and realize that like all right this is the wines are made this way because that's what the fruit is and we're not trying to force any square pegs or round holes it's just 
really unique and and we're, we realize how fortunate we are with the area and the food that grows here absolutely kind of going along the same lines are there any specific qualities that you look for your wines to have? Like, are they made for early drinking? Are they made to age? Do you like them to really reflect the vintage and the terroir? Yeah, so the wines that we have are tooled into uh, the, you know, seasonal drinking, uh, ageability, and what the wine is going to do over the trajectory of its, of its life. So with like a rosé, or our uh, Grunerveld leader, uh, typically they can be drank young, you know, within three to six months of being bottled, but they do age well, you know, that, so those wines, they have nice steady arcs, but those younger, fresher styles that maybe have a little more bound CO2 for fermentation, you want to present them at an early age. The Rieslings typically, they age for about a year in the bottle before they're released just to let things come together. And then, like I said, with the Reds, you know, they're about two years old before they're released to the public. Um, you know, but these wines, they're, they're, they are their own individual uh, framework at the beginning of their life. It's just that where we feel that they transcend best is if they're given a certain amount of age. So, uh -huh. It's really, it's up for anybody's interpretation, but this is what we like to present. Fantastic. And finally, I have to ask, how have you been dealing with the exceptional circumstances of 2020 um, at the winery? Have you had to make any big changes to your business or to your sales side? And what stage are you at right now in, in reopening to the public? Well, we're, we're open to the public. Um, it's a uh, reservation only, so you know, either online or calling ahead. Uh, you know, we, with many things, Lamoureux was kind of ahead of the curve and we were already working on a program of uh, doing reservation program. So we had uh, uh, a procedure in place. So when we were shut down for three months, we just, you know, we had already in place, uh, a, like I said, a procedure to do. So it was relatively seamless. You know, we saw a huge uptick in uh, online sales with shipping wine directly to, to, to consumers. Uh, you know, we just, we, it was, you know, it was a challenging uh, chain of events that occurred, but we seemed to just sort of walk through it with strides and unfettered and just took it as just another, another uh, opportunity versus, uh, you know, a pitfall and we've really done well with it. So, yeah, you know, it's, it's a unique in what's happening in the world and in the Finger Lakes, but, you know, if I have anything, it's, a, I look at it as a positive thing because we're gaining new insight on who, on who comes in during these times and the wines that people are interested in and what people are buying and where we can go from here. So, you know, it's, I don't look at it as, at least from a winemaking standpoint, um, and then what people are appreciating, I look at it as like a really great time to take in what people are connecting with, with Lamoureux's wines. And it's, it's, it's pretty exciting. Like it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good thing and, you know, it's, yeah, I'm looking at it in a positive way. Great. Well, I'm glad to hear that. That's a great way to look at it. I can't wait until I can come back and visit again. Yeah. Hopefully sometime not too long from now. Um, I don't have any more questions for you at the moment. Is there anything that we didn't discuss that people should know about Lamoureux? Uh, gosh. Well, um, I don't think I touched on, we do, we have a sparkling program. So it's 100% mm -hmm. estate grown. I don't know if I mentioned that either. Um, but uh, our sparkling program is pretty impressive. It's all in-house disgorging. So we have this ability to do some pretty incre incredible um, techniques that uh, I believe more Finger Lakes wineries, every Finger Lakes winery should be making sparkling. But Lamro is unique in that we also have a really deep uh, library program. So we just discouraged some 2006 that was available. Very cool. Uh, 2009. Um, yeah, and like I said earlier, this year we're working on uh, the, 20, or the 2019 sparkling program. So that won't be out for few years at least three years uh, and uh, let's see what else is it traditional method transfer method Charmot? 
Traditional, yep. So hand modeled and then uh, in in Taraj for three years and then disgorged and Great. all that good stuff. Love it. Love some sparkling. <laughs> yeah, it was a lot of fun. Um, yeah, no, it's uh, no, we're just. I just love making wine here and it's such a great spot. It's really, you know, it's so unique and I've worked in many wineries in the Finger Lakes and it's, this is one of the top ones I can speak and yeah, it's just good. It's good here. Great. Well, we're so glad to have you part of the guide this year. Well, I suppose not this year, 2021. Um, and thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today. Oh, well, thank you. Have a great rest of your week. You too. All right. Bye. Bye.